Reactor online. Sensors online. Weapons online. All systems nominal. Hey everyone, B1B Flyer here. I'm going to show you how I painted this new plastic Shalone aerospace fighter in the colors of the free Rasselhag Republic's first Draken. This also happens to be the same unit scheme shown in the Tyra Miraborg Alpha Strike card artwork, which will work great as a color reference throughout painting. This is an advanced tutorial using a wide variety of techniques, and the final result will be a CSO quality level of detail. Instead of my normal paint rundown, I'll just show you what I used at each step as they occur. I'll also include a list of all paints and materials in the video description for reference. I've started by airbrushing Stylo Res Black Primer over the entire model. I chose a buildup from black to help create panel gradients. I'll be using my Badger Sotar 2020 airbrush and several drops of airbrush flow improver added to the cup. I use flow improver nearly 100% of the time as a retarder and thinner for paint. I like to have it in the cup before I add a couple drops of Vallejo model color neutral gray for my base color. Finally, I'll add several drops of water to fully thin the paint down and then take an old brush to mix it together in the cup. I want a thinner mix with this smaller needle size detail airbrush and to allow more control of the gradual panel buildup. I'm at about 18 to 20 psi on my airbrush for those of you wondering. A quick function test of the mix and it's time to start painting the gray panels. I'm focusing on hitting the middle of each large area first so that it will end up as the brightest area as I work over the sections I want gray. Since the paint is thin and I don't want to spend too much time in one spot to avoid pooling and spider webbing as well as keep a gradual dark gradient towards the panel sections. As each area dries and the color mutes down, I'll be able to see where to come back and apply more paint to brighten. For the underside, I'm not going to be as careful or concerned about those gradients as it simply won't be seen much at all unless the model is turned over. This is still a good place to practice trigger and paint control, so perhaps if you're still getting comfortable with your airbrush, start on the underside where mistakes are easily hidden. As you can see, I've worked the major areas one at a time, then started with the minor areas like the stabilizers and engine. This helps me to focus on one section and not be tempted to try and paint it all at once too quickly. Rushing techniques like this won't yield as nice of a result, and taking a minute to let the paint flash dry really isn't much time to wait at all. I'll almost constantly blow air over the model to speed along the drying, but if the coat happens to be heavy and still very wet, be careful not to push the still wet paint around and create ripples. Now I'll add some more to the middle sections of the panels to build up a brighter gray. Take your time with this and use just a little paint at a time. Trigger control is important, so practice adding a small amount of paint to your airflow. Finally, I'll set up the glow of the engines with a quick shot of gray to cover the black primer and let it dry for a moment while I move to the lighter gray. It's time to start highlighting those panels. I poured out the neutral gray, but not cleaned out the cup so that the residual previous color will blend with the new one. I've added model color sky gray in the same thinning method as before, and now I'm very deliberately focusing on the center sections of each individual panel. I'm constantly running the air and then using a very light pull with the trigger to get just a small amount of paint applied. If you need to, drop the pressure down to about 14 to 16 PSI on your regulator. This is about watching the modulation of color on each section and deciding if you want to add even more or leave them as they are. You don't have to hit every panel with the same amount of intensity, but for this very symmetrical model, I'm keeping things pretty even. You can watch it as it happens where the bright paint mutes down quickly due to being so thin, which is why several applications may be needed to get the brightness where you're happy with it. I'm going to let this dry, then apply a coat of gloss Krylon enamel to protect my work. Here's how the gray areas looked before I gloss coated and masked them off. I've let my clear coat dry, and now I've already started using Tamiya model masking tape to cover the highlighted gray areas. Tamiya is a low adherence tape, but airbrush layers are so thin that the clear coat is an insurance policy against damaging what's beneath. Using a straight section and the artwork as a guide, I'm laying down my tape to establish where I want the hard color lines to be. Trim down as needed, and don't be afraid to restick or remove and start again. 
You may have complex curves and shapes to deal with, so trim or work in smaller sections if it's needed. I like to use a round toothpick to push down the edges to make sure I don't get any uneven lines from overspray. It's easier to control and more accurate than my finger or fingernail and won't dig into the paint surfaces. You can see I've already finished the one side, top and bottom, and I'll complete the rest off camera. I'm adding Reaper Master Series Brion Blue to my Flow Improver Thinning Mix to use as my blue base coat for the wings and fuselage. Reaper paints tend to be a bit thicker and I usually add a bit more water to them when airbrushing. The same process applies here with the exception that I'm going to be careful to spray away from the taped edge to avoid pushing any wet paint beneath the tape. I did run into a bit of a clog in my airbrush right after starting and had to clear it before getting very far. The blue is going to mask well with the black and already help keep the dark color on the panels, so it isn't as easy to see this darker black undercoat transition while I work. Try to focus on the middle of the panels, but don't worry if it isn't as sharp as the gray, because the highlight steps will be much more prominent on the blue. Again, the underside is not a huge focus area, so I'm only taking a quick time to coat the bottom side and not try to bring it up as bright due to the fact that there's natural shadows. Don't forget the leading and trailing edges of the wings. They're easy to miss because of the dark colors being used right now. I'm making sure the top sides of aircraft panels all have at least a couple passes to fully establish this faded blue in preparation for highlights. If you find uneven areas as it dries, give them another pass, and again be cognizant of not putting too much paint on at once to avoid a wet edge near the tape lines. I'll use Reaper Master Series Templar Blue as my blue highlight, I've used this color pairing before, and I know how nicely they go together, so I recommend them if you don't have them. You can see me backflow the brush just to make sure the paint in the needle chamber isn't still the previous color, and then test out on the paper to verify my mix isn't too dry or wet. Right from the start, you can see how much a difference this blue makes on the panels. Be deliberate with the paint and allow it to dry a bit before you come back for follow-on layer. I like to highlight minor areas while the major ones are drying to help save time, but go as slow as you need in order to do a good job. I know highlighting the bottom of the wing isn't realistic, but it's a quick shot of paint to make it pop a bit and set the overall blue tone. You don't have to do that if you want to keep things more realistic and dark on the underside. I'm blowing a lot of air on the model even though you can't hear it. I want to let that paint flash dry to reveal its final level of brightness and touch up any areas I see that were missed or uneven. I've left the Templar Blue in the cup, and now I'm adding some of that previously used Sky Gray into the airbrush. I want to lighten it to a pale blue color using the Templar Blue as a base so that it merges smoothly. Mix it really well to make sure you don't get a surge of darker blue. This is where you'll see a dramatic shift of the colors as I focus on the highest edges and centers of each panel to give them that pop of bright faded blue. I'm going very slowly and using as little paint as possible with the trigger control to prevent putting down too much paint in an area. Shorter passes and quick touch up bursts are where I'm going to get things evenly applied and built up in due time. This is definitely where stylized panel highlights come into play and you can really get a striking effect with placement of the color. I'm focusing on high edges and trying to be consistent with their placement on each individual joining panel so that the illusion of a single light source reflecting off of them is more believable. Again, those quick shots of color in a small spot are a bit tricky to do, but if you are using just the smallest amount of paint each time, a miss isn't as bad as you can correct the next application spot and build it up from there. Again, I'm constantly running just air over the freshly painted surfaces to speed up the drying and reveal the true intensity of the paint. Then I'll determine any touch-ups and whether or not it may be too much to push any further. You'll occasionally see me pull the airbrush a bit further from the model and apply a very thin blending shot over an area. This is to clean up any harder transition mistakes I may have made by increasing the disbursement pattern. Be careful when doing this as it can cover the previous color transitions if done too much. There is definitely a less is more method to this type of highlighting, so if you're 75 to 95% happy with how an area looks, I recommend you leave it as it is and avoid overdoing it with the next pass. Lastly, don't forget to take a look at all the small fins and minor detail sections and see if a quick shot of highlight is needed to bring it up just a bit. 
This model has a lot of little details that look so much better when given just a bit of a highlight, and it's so easy to get that done now with the airbrush. I'll let all of that work dry for a few minutes before removing the masking tape. That toothpick or a small rounded tweezer is good for lifting edges to help remove the tape. With the base coats done, the accent red is next. For that I'm using Pro Acryl Burnt Red as a base and a good quality detail brush. I'm following the artwork exactly by painting the control surfaces and canopy bow. Using palette paper, I'm applying the paint straight from the bottle and may occasionally add a brush full of water to keep it thin enough to work with. Use a wet palette for this if you want to avoid paint drying. Try to keep the paint out of the recesses, but if you get some in there, don't worry because a wash will help mask it very well later on. This red has really good coverage, so I'm focusing on keeping it smooth and away from anything I don't want red. It makes for a nice base coat and is dark enough that the highlights later will be more noticeable. A darker red would be fine as well if you want to work up from a bit of a darker base. Fortunately, nearly all the areas that have this accent color are very easy to reach and the panel gaps between them are nice and defined, so if you maneuver the model and the brush angles well, it's very easy to keep from making any many mistakes on the blue or the gray. Because this model is symmetrical, I'm only going to show cuts of me painting one half of the model to save you from watching even more paint dry. Don't forget to paint the bottom and the trailing edges of the surfaces red to complete the base coat. Here's the progress on the base colors being applied. You can see my photo box shows the color modulation much better than the light under my desk lamp that washes it out a bit. To quickly base coat the top side vent details, I'm using some Vallejo Neutral Gray thinned with a bit of water and applying it to the vents and minor raised edge panels. This is just a quick step for a few detail areas that were too hard to mask, but I wanted to match the existing engine color. The next step is to add a black line or pin wash to all the recessed areas I want to have a strong shadow. You can see I've already done this step to the underside of the model, and it makes a massive impact on the appearance of the colors. Of course you'll notice the decals I've added, and I'll mention those a bit later. I'm using GW Contrast Medium added to Basiliconum Gray Contrast Paint as my pin wash color. I've mixed them at around 50-50, so that it's not a true black, but it still gets a very strong shadow as the contrast works like it should and hugs the recesses and corners. Using my fine detail brush, I'm just working small amounts of paint directly into the panel lines. From the start, I make a small mistake and wipe it with my finger, but a damp swab or paper towel can do that for you as well. The trick to this process is to take your time and use the brush's ability to hold a bit of the wash and then touch the tip of the brush into the recess and let it flow down. For areas that are raised or not as deeply defined, you can rely on the contrast medium's viscosity to flow around the lesser defined edge and gently push it into the areas you want like the vents and engine components. For lining areas that are just corners or joining panels, but not as recessed, you will want to focus on pulling your brush towards the center of your body and will need to orient the model accordingly. This gives you the best chance for a straight pull to help avoid shaking and getting paint too far out from the corners. If you make a mistake, have a damp brush, paper towel, or a swab handy to push the paint towards the dark area or to completely wipe it away depending on the amount of paint. I know it looks like I'm just flying through this process, but I assure you it's due to a lot of practice. Some of the techniques I've shared and really the one thing that I can't teach you is that I'm relaxed while doing this. I'm not worried about making a mistake because I know I can fix it. It helps to keep me from getting tense and a relaxed brush stroke is much smoother than a rigid one. There will be a bit of the pin wash that can creep out over the edges, especially on smaller or less defined gaps. That's okay to have it as it will diminish once the paint dries and because I'll be doing quite a bit of weathering later on. It will all be lost in the mix after it's all complete. A quick note about the decals, the Free Rasselhag Republic emblems are from Fighting Piranha Graphics, and the numbers are from a 172 scale MiG-21 aircraft decal sheet that I bought on eBay. The numbers are a very close match even with the white outline to the ones that are on the artwork and it saved me a ton of time and hassle trying to freehand or stencil them. I use decal setting solution to help the decals flatten out and look painted on. As I trace my way around all the little areas, I want to show a dark shadow. I'm checking for consistent pigment as the paint dries. Contrast takes a while to fully cure, especially in areas where it's allowed to collect. 
you'll see me go back over spots that have already had the paint flow away from them and I'm just adding another touch of the wash to help reestablish that nice dark shadow. This step may take more than one pass depending on the wash you use in your mix, but you should at least expect a few touch-ups if you're using contrast paint. I didn't show the specific step, but I put a coat or two of this wash on top of the two front light lenses at the very front of the wings to darken them for future drooling. Here's the wash all dried. You can see it's not as dark of black, but the gray has worked very well in defining the panels. I've got some areas where I had a few mistakes, but again, those won't matter when I'm done with the weathering. The contrast pin wash is dry, and now I'm going to start working on the canopy with some Vallejo model color, ochre brown, and a fine detail brush. I just want to block this color in to use as my mid-tone to step up and down from. The artwork shows the small dome is also a glass piece, so I'm carefully painting it as well. I'm doing my best to keep from getting any ochre in the recesses as I don't want to mess with my shaded lines if I don't need to. I've added a bit of airbrush flow improver to the paint to keep it from drying too much. I'll usually just add a loaded brush full or one single drop and then any more thinning is done with water. It does mean that I'm typically needing to do a few coats to get them even, but it keeps me from building up a texture or brush stroke lines from the paint drying too quickly or being applied too thick. You'll also notice I did add some neutral gray off camera to the two lenses at the forward sections of each of the wings. It's time to do some oil blending, so I've got my oil working synthetic brushes and some yellow and red MIG oil brushers on my palette paper. You can see on the left side of the aircraft, the yellow and red have been applied and the panels have some orange highlights to them. To do that, I'm applying the brighter red oil to the top edges of the control surfaces. I'm simply laying down a line or a few dots of paint in some cases. This will establish my blending foundation for the oils after I start smoothing them out with my larger brush. I just want to disperse the paint a bit and leave the darker edges untouched so there's still a transition remaining. The process is a gentle stipple to push the paint up to the brightest edge. Once I'm happy with how the bright to dark looks, I'll move over to the yellow. Again, I'm just running lines or dots of yellow oil paint in the areas I want to have that blend start. Yellow is tricky even with oils, but try not to put too much on at once versus adding a little bit more bit by bit each for each round of blending. Again, a gentle stipple motion to push the yellow towards the brightest areas and corners is what I'm trying to do here. As the yellow begins to establish over the red, I'll try to keep from letting it get too bright and if necessary, go and add a slight touch of red to the area to blend it back down. Once the control surfaces are all done with the oil blending, I'll grab some Pro Acryl Pyrrole Red and use it to highlight the canopy bow since the details are too small to try and blend oils over. Once I'm finished with all the oil blending, I'll let the model sit for at least 4-8 to eight hours and then use my gloss enamel to put a protective clear coat over everything. I also added jeweling to the weapons and position lights after the clear coat dried. To work up the engine glow effect, I'm using Reaper's LED Blue with Flow Improver and Water. The light gray that was laid down before will really help enhance the bright contrasting effect I'm going for. I've dropped my pressure down to about 12, maybe 15 psi, and I'm using very short pulses of paint to see where it's building up and adjusting as needed. I have to keep the nozzle close to avoid too much dispersion, which can cause spider webbing or pooling if I'm not careful. I'm running the air constantly to help speed drying. I know I'm going to focus on the centers, but I also want that OSL effect to spill out onto the trailing edges as, I'd light, as light would reflect from a few areas of the exhaust. Fortunately for me, most of the misses I had from aiming at the center of the engine cones helped me along with getting that done. I'll take a look after things dry up and then grab an old synthetic brush moistened with water to use as a cleanup method. The paint is so thin that it will not adhere well to the gloss coat, and even a quick swipe of the finger will take down any overspray fairly easily as long as you don't wait too long. After cleaning up a few of the major spots, I'll come back in and do some reinforcing on any areas that are uneven inside the engine cone because they should look uniformly showing the light source. This may take a few sessions of letting it dry, touching up, and spraying again. But work slowly, it's a small area and it's such a neat effect it's worth being patient. 
Of course, I wanted more pop out of the look, so I went and grabbed a detail brush so I could directly apply white. In this case, Model Color Off-White by Vallejo. I wanted the center of each engine to really have that white hot look with just a tinge of blue and purple, so I'm setting this up as an undercoat for the next step in the process. I've thinned the paint again with Flow Improver so that it doesn't dry too quickly on my brush as white paint tends to do, and it means I need to work slower to let each successive layer dry, but after a couple coats it's now nice and bright in the center. For the purple, I'm using Army Painter Purple Tone Wash and a bit of the Wash Mix Medium to thin it so it flows into the crevices and dries more transparent than the full strength wash would. I just want it to creep around the recesses in the engine nozzle veins and halo around the center. I'll have to work the wash into each area and move it just a bit to keep it from pooling and then of course let it dry completely before I go back to using the airbrush. I've loaded the Flow Improver Thinned Off-White into the airbrush and I'm just wanting to put a slight transparent layer over the center of the engines again. This is a bit of a hope it works out moment for me because I actually hadn't tried it out before this step. You can see it didn't take much before I was happy with the result and I got right to taking my brush out and removing the extra bright white overspray from areas that wouldn't be showing any source lighting. I'm sticking to the spots that are outside the engine areas and aggressively swiping away that excess. I know the top of the engine looks like it has a lot of paint there, but the light from my desk lamp combined with the gloss had me going for a bit even as I was watching this video footage. I'm happy with how the glow looks and the final result pictures will show how much better it looks than on video. I've raised the model up closer to the camera to give a better view of the detail work I'm about to do. Pro Acryl Orange will work well for an edge highlight color over the blended reds. Again, I've mostly completed the left side of the mini and will demonstrate on the right. If you haven't picked up on this already from the rest of the tutorial, I tend to always add a bit of flow improver to whatever color I'm using for detail and edge work to prevent it from drying on the bristles as well as to aid in its removal when paired with a gloss coat if I mess up. You'll see me use my finger and even a careful fingernail to swipe and scrape paint off the model while painting. It's a helpful trick that eases a bit of the pressure from trying to be really careful. Like for instance, my orange paint loaded brush touching the left wing of the model I've spent hours working on. A moist cotton swab can also help provide a bit of extra tooth to help clean off any mistakenly applied paint. Isopropyl alcohol is also an option as a last resort before repainting if it's a particularly tough type of stain to remove, but use it sparingly and be gentle. If the gloss coat wasn't evenly applied, the alcohol could get into the acrylic beneath and do bad things to the paint job. The bottom line is that a gloss coat works great and I suggest its use when practical to help you out if you're working on something very important or having a tough time while painting details. You can see how much the gloss coat helps me out as I make mistake after mistake. I'd like to say that it's all because I'm literally painting around a camera that's in my face so you can see a better view, but that's not the sole cause. Some days are better than others for painting details and this round was one I had to do a lot of cleanup with. I'm still picking corners and edges to pop out the areas I want brightest and going back over edges I want to add a bolder highlight. I'm going back to that sky gray with flow improver for the blue and gray panels edge work. The prominent top edges are the easiest to pick out first. So if you're still trying to get used to this kind of highlighting and don't know where to start, start at the top and then take a look at the model at a bit of a distance under strong light and it may help guide your future decisions. Don't be afraid to just do a partial edge. The light doesn't have to hit every single angular area, but if you like a strong appearance, then it's certainly still a good looking method. Thankfully, those deep recesses between panels really help when they have uh, having to edge highlight the wing sections. I'm taking my time, but also supporting the model and resting my right hand's fingers on my left while I do it to give myself as much support for the brush strokes. I'm actually just rocking my hand left and right instead of trying to use my fingers to control this application. I didn't plan this, I just noticed that I'm doing it while narrating and realized my brain helped me solve the problem of stabilizing my hands on a raised desk platform. I'm also just doing one side of the gaps. I'm personally not a fan of the both hard edges being highlighted in most cases. That doesn't mean I don't do it on some things from time to time. I just know that when every single edge is given the same highlight, I'm not as happy with the overall appearance. 
Don't forget to maneuver your model in a way that helps you reach some of those tighter areas and still use the brush edge. I'll occasionally forget now and then and find myself trying to paint at an angle that is not ideal. I'll go back to check on the areas I want the brightest points of reflection and reinforce the edges with some more of the gray. This is partly due to the thin paint, but also the fact that I'm highlighting blue, which once the gray dries, will have some translucency and take down the intensity of the gray on top. What's the solution? Add more paint. Have fun picking out all the little minor details like fins and stabilizers on the wings as well as the rounded weapon ports and leading edge greeblies. If you're not going to do much or any weathering after this edge highlight, then I would give it a good once over to check for any breaks and missed areas. I'll be doing a lot of weathering with a foam sponge and that tends to cover up a great deal which I had accounted for already. Now it's time to ruin the paint job. To weather this model, I'll be starting with Reaper Master Series Rainy Gray and a torn piece of small cell foam like you'd get in a pluck foam storage tray. Even after years of painting, I'll still have a brief second where my voice in my head screams, don't do it you idiot. But once that first dab of the foam hits the model, I tell it to shut up, we've already gone too far. If you're wondering why I started with a light color, it's for a couple reasons. First, I want to try to match the art and the chip paint on the leading edges of the wings has a lot of what I decided was a primer undercoat showing, which was a light gray. The second reason is that I'm going to follow up with progressively darker colors to help show depth, scoring, carbon streaking, and deeper gouges in the metal. I've shown this foam technique before many times and it really is easy to learn and use effectively once you try it out a few times. Dab the sponge on some paper towel after loading it with your paint so that you don't have too much wet paint sitting on the foam and work gently. Also, if you're unsure about how much paint is on the foam before you start to use it, try dabbing it on some other surface like a hex base or a practice model to get a feel for it. If you get too much in one spot, immediately try those quick paint removal tips I've already mentioned and try again later. I've already picked out the leading edges where I want to focus my chipped paint areas and followed up with more random areas throughout the entire model. This fighter has seen a lot of action defending against the clan invasion and it's flown through a lot of debris and been shot up a few times. You can see how much contrast the gray gives over the darker colors and that's exactly what I wanted to achieve with this step. Don't be afraid to throw a few dabs over decals as well. It really helps sell the realism and make them look more, more weathered and realistic. The next color is Vallejo Motto Color Khaki. If you watch this channel, you know I use this color a lot and I want the subtle brown hue to merge with the gray I've applied while still being light enough to contrast the dark reds and blue tones. The same method applies here and using a different part of the same sponge or a different piece altogether to help add variety to the application pattern, I'll go in and touch the areas where I have the gray. I'm definitely trying to put less paint on the model than before so that the khaki enhances instead of overtakes the gray. If you try this out and find you went a bit too far, you can go back with the gray using foam or even just a detail brush and spot paint it back to a more gray color. Again, I know the gloss hides some of the appearance of the paint on the camera, but when you're looking at the model, you'll be able to see where you want to add more weathering. This type of paintwork is very subjective. Some like more, some like less. It's a very personal choice on what style you like best, so take it to a level you're happy with and be comfortable with your decision. Now for the last layer, I'm going to use my go-to weathering color. I really like using Viejo model color German Black Brown on just about every model I weather. The color is very dark, so it shows up well on all kinds of schemes, and it's such a strong pigment that I can dab most of the paint off the with the foam and get very tiny specks of visible color when I want to. I'm placing this color a lot more on the larger areas and surfaces to just add that natural worn and scratched look. I want it to darken a few areas on the leading edges of the wings and panels, but I also want it to use it to help create streaking, grimy sections and a bit of light carbon buildup which I'll get to in a moment after I've laid down my initial layer of black-brown. To accomplish the streak effect, I've changed the way the foam surface applies paint by creating a wedge shape so I can more precisely dab a bit of paint in an area. I'll also leave just a bit more paint on the foam so that I can have a bit of a wet paint to streak with my finger. When aircraft leak fluid, it tends to spread over a wide area, so the staining is going to represent that effect. 
I'll just pick out a few areas where there's a gap to have some fluid streak out into the airstream and put a spot of paint there to smudge with my finger. It doesn't take a lot and it's kind of subtle depending on the color combinations. If I want to keep adding paint, I can make a larger area appear dirty and stained with continued smudging of the paint. Finally, moving on to the canopy and front light lenses, I've got several paints on my palette. Pro Acryl Transparent Black, Viejo Model Color Ice Yellow, Ochre Brown, Game Color Leather Brown, and I'm bringing back the Rainy Gray and Off-White from earlier in the tutorial. Again, I've added Flow Improver to each one, and then a touch of water if needed for the thicker paints. Based on the artwork, this cockpit is gold, so I'll try to achieve a non-metallic metal reflection. I'm starting out by reapplying a layer of the ochre brown to even out any missed areas as well as to touch up any spots that may have gotten other colors from the weathering steps. This brings up the vibrancy just a bit more, which is what I'll want as this color is going to be my mid-tone. Now working with rainy gray, I'm going to paint diagonal highlights on the light lenses to set up for the chrome style lens jeweling. I want a fairly wide line to work with starting out on the pattern, since the gray is the mid-tone. Everything either goes brighter or darker from there. Then I'll grab the white and immediately start to place my center reflection spots. Working with light brush strokes and trying to keep just the very tip of the brush in contact with the model, I'm building up the intensity of the white by making multiple small streak lines that will help sell the effect later on. Don't get bothered too much if the lines end up too wide or you're not happy at first. I myself am rarely satisfied with the first application results when painting this kind of detail. It's a small area to fix, and remember that the colors can be applied over and back again until you get what you're looking for. Paint consistency is very important with this kind of technique, so you may need to mess with some ratios to find the right amount of balance for your particular brand or color to prevent it from being too thick and fast drying, or too thin and uncontrollable. Speaking of that, Either I had a bit too much water left on my brush from a rinse, or the paint might have been too thin and pooled a bit on the model when I went to apply some gray next to it, and I ended up having paint flow into the surrounding panel recess. My best advice is don't be like me, and do better at keeping any white out of the panel lines as much as possible. But in all seriousness, just quickly use your brush with a bit of water to help remove as much as you can if it happens. A brief moment or two between working on either side helps the paint layers or in my case mistake cleanup, to dry a bit so I'm being more efficient with my time by painting them both simultaneously. Also, working with the black on opposite ends away from the recently applied gray and white lets me do a couple of things at once. I'm shading the corners to establish depth with the black, and then using small amounts of gray mixed together to work the shadow blend towards the white from the corner. This narrows the brighter areas and really starts to set off the reflection effect like in the artwork. As the white dries and mutes, you may find it not as vibrant. That's not unusual, so as I mentioned before, follow-up co coats and touch-ups will likely be needed. Work the white and gray until you're happy with the appearance, but continue to stop and let it dry a little bit between layers by waiting or working on another part of the model. A good idea is to reinforce any black in the edges or recesses to keep you busy between layers of color. I'll be repeating the process a couple more times so the video will run for a few more minutes before the last bit of this step is finished. Skip ahead if you wish, or enjoy the music without me repeating everything I've already said.
you can see gradual results that the first few iterations of coming back to the white streaks and adjoining gray blends has achieved so far. But again, I'm repeating the process to build up intensity and attempt to add more fine line streaks. Transparent black is not black paint, so as it dries, I'm taking a look to find weaker shadows and touching them up at the same time. Remember how small these details are in relation to the rest of the model, and don't get stuck in a constant back and forth. The non-metallic metal chrome for the lights is a style choice that had I not been following the artwork, would have been done in my usual jeweled and then gloss final coat style that I prefer. It's fun to try things out that I don't normally do though, and I will say I'm happy with how it came out. I'm starting to use the black in the corners out of the main cockpit just to keep engaged and productive while the other paint is drying. On the cockpit, I'll start with the transparent black just to show you the opposite of the silver method. This color is pretty thin, so I need to let it dry thoroughly or I'll end up fighting the wet paint and undoing the previous layer. Keeping approximately the same diagonal angle as the other reflections, I'm going to sketch out my darkest areas first to help them capture the overall size of the shadow I'll be painting. I'm just working it to the middle gradually, but leaving a good amount in the outermost corners to maximize the pigment left there. Because I'm painting over a brighter color than the gray from the previous lenses, it will take a few layers to build up the darkest corners to a true black. Sure, I could just use black paint, but the benefit of using the transparent black is that I start out with what is essentially a gradient to build up from, so it's like highlighting in reverse to get out to the darkest shadowed corners. If I had been thinking about it, I could have done these diagonal corner shadows at the same time I was working with the black on the lights, but then I wouldn't be able to share with you the tip of try to do multiple panels with the same color you're working with when you can to be more efficient and consistent. You can see how it isn't much of a wait for the layers to dry as I work between the four shadowed areas. I would say that this is basically a glaze technique of applying multiple transparent layers to establish a highlight, or in this case, a shadow. I'm also taking the opportunity to put paint into the panel line recesses to ensure I have the darkest black to contrast against the red canopy trim. Relying heavily on the art as my color guide, I've added ice yellow to my brush, and with the larger surface area you can see the streak reflection lines I'm putting down as a sketch outline for my colors. Again, if it ends up too much in one spot, go back to the ochre brown or black and start over if needed. Generally, I find I always have to do a bit of back and forth with a few colors until I get the effect I'm looking for. I hadn't really attempted to do a sharp streaking reflection style canopy before this, but because I had the artwork to use as a guide, I just mimicked the pattern from the rendering and did my best with color choices to turn out a non-metallic gold. Trying to get some sharp separation lines isn't for everyone, so if it's troublesome for you, try to paint a fewer but wider lines or go for a more traditional jeweling style. If you're finding it difficult to paint the smallest details like this, it helps to give yourself some extra room to work by using larger transitions. Using larger lines or blends will save you time and possible frustration, and the contrast from the light to dark will still look good, especially at a normal viewing distance. I suggest you find your style and color preference and practice being consistent. That way you can always default to going with a particular style and then try to branch out to other methods or higher detail work when you're ready. Now that I've put down my initial brightest highlights, I'm going to reinforce or touch up the black and start to introduce the leather brown to merge the black and ochre. A bit of the transparent black on the brush isn't a problem and helps darken the leather color. It's now a game of touch up and sharpen whatever looks like it needs to be worked on. This is yet again completely subjective and you may find you like the first pass and stop, or you might go back several times to make the touch ups you need to get the colors just right. Just with the white on their silver reflections, the ice yellow needs to be reinforced after drying to help build up a bit more intensity. This is where I'm going in and hitting edges to make the reflection effect start to come to life. It's a tight space around the canopy edge, so take your time, support your model, and try to stay relaxed. A stippling brush stroke can help keep the stress level down because you can push the last bit of paint to the edges and don't actually have to make contact with the outermost edge to set the paint down where it needs to go. Paint consistency is really critical and you don't want it to dry out while you're working. 
I'm using just small amounts of pigment on my brush, not even stopping to wash the bristles and using the strength of the color to do the work while I accept any merging of the previously used colors. Don't forget to do the bottom of the cockpit glass. It should be pretty quick since it's not really easy to see and wouldn't reflect much light. After working on the main canopy, it should go really quickly. And with that, I finished the model. I put a coat of Vallejo matte varnish over everything, and then a few applications of Citadel Ard Coat to the lasers and position lights to add a true gloss reflection to them. I'm really happy with how this project turned out, and I had a lot of fun over the couple days spent working with this larger model. Thanks for joining me in this tutorial. Please take us out, Tex. We certainly hope you enjoyed this video. Please subscribe and leave your questions or comments below. Follow us on Facebook at Battletech Camo Specs Online. Check out our website at camospecs.com. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time. Heat critical, shutdown imminent, time for Pop Tarts.